All right. Good morning. Good morning, and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. Um, day after the Christmas holiday, for those of you who were very busy yesterday, as I was. Same here, for sure. <laughs> welcome. To jo glad you're here to jo joining us today. Um, I am your host, Krista Porter, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly webinar series where we cover a variety of topics that may be of interest to um, libraries. The show is broadcast live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time. But if you're unable to join us on Wednesdays, that's fine. You can always watch our recordings later. We have them all on our website, and I'll show you at the end of today's show where to access our archives. Both the live show and the archives are free and open to anyone to watch. So please do share with your friends, family, neighbors, colleagues, anybody who you think might be interested in any of our topics. Um, at the Nebraska Library Commission, we are the state agency for libraries in Nebraska, and it's all types of libraries. So we will have things on the show that are for academics, K-12, uh, public libraries, uh, correctional facilities, special, uh, we've got museums on, anything that's a library or is library related, we'll have it on the show. So you can find all sorts of things out there. Uh, we do a mixture of things here, book reviews, interviews, mini training sessions sometimes. Uh, demos, any any products and services that we may think of will be of interest to any um, libraries out there, um, and updates on services and things that are going on. Uh, we do bring in guest speakers sometimes to the show from um, around the, Nebraska and around the country, but today we have we also have Nebraska Library Commission staff, and that's what we have today. Uh, Scott Schultz is our director of our Talking Book and Braille service here at the Nebraska Library Commission. It's just across the hall right. from where our offices are. <laughs> <laughs> um, and he's going to talk about all the new things they have coming to TBBS, which yeah. is very exciting. Huge yeah. changes coming up. Um, so I will just hand it over to you, Scott, to take Sounds it away and well, uh, you. share. Um, yeah. And you can use either the keyboard or the mouse. Okay. Sometimes the keyboard's okay. a little. Yeah, that sounds there. good. Perfect. Well, hello, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. And um, yeah, because we have such a, a varied audience that tunes into the show, um, the presentation I have for you is kind of a combination of practical stuff for talking book libraries, but also some more philosophical, to think about some of the philosophical implications of this change for, you know, even how, how it might apply to public libraries or academic libraries in the future um, as things switch to being more flexible in terms of being file formats rather than always a, a physical object. Mm -hmm. So yeah. um, as, you're, as you're tuning in, um, if you're not at a talking book library, maybe there will be some things you can think about from, from that kind of perspective on how to handle digital archives and that sort of thing. So yeah. um, without further ado, yeah, um, it's pretty, uh, we, hi Sue, we did get a message from you there too. Okay. And uh, yeah, things are um, pretty quiet here too. Um, yeah. The only creature stirring is the mouse on this computer here, so <laughs> we'll see how that goes. So without further ado, let's jump in and talk a little bit about a new process called duplication on demand. Uh, which we just began to use in late October of this year here in Nebraska. Uh, I believe we were the seventh library um, to switch over to this. There, uh, this system was created by the National Library Service, um, who is essentially kind of our parent organization. Um, the National Library Service is a division of the Library of Congress, and they're tasked with providing uh, talking book service throughout the country. Um, each state kind of handles it themselves. Um, some states with larger populations may have multiple libraries, like a regional and, and several sub-regional libraries. Um, in the case of Nebraska, we serve the entire state. Um, we have about 3,600 patrons um, spread throughout the state. And um, we primarily mail things to them. Uh, they can also download things. But, but hey, I guess we're about to talk about some of those, those different technologies as well. So I'll go ahead and move to the first slide here. Um, I'm going to start by talking a little bit about the <clears throat> excuse me, about the uh, history of talking books in terms of being physical objects. Um, this is very similar, obviously, to handling books and other materials, uh, physical materials in, in any kind of library, public or academic or whatever. Um, so we, too, have been uh, historically um, taking materials and shelving them, figuring out how best to deliver them to patrons. Um, who, in the case of talking book libraries, may not necessarily be physically close to the library. Mm -hmm. So they have a lot of situations where we have to figure out how things can be mailed. Um, so with the history of the technology behind talking books, if you go all the way back to the early 1930s, um, talking books started on 33 and a third RPM records. Um, at the time, the, the proprietary commercial format was still 78 RPM, mm -hmm. and so it was considered a proprietary format at the time, which helped to protect copyright. 
Um, what happened in the early 30s um, is the, uh, at the beginning of the talking book service, it was decided that um, in order to, to serve veterans and blind adults, books could be recorded and then placed onto these records and circulated within essentially a closed system. Um, people who signed up and applied to use the service uh, verified that they had a, a visual impairment uh, that was bringing them to the service at the time. Um, and so in order to protect copyright, which didn't really become an issue in the 30s, of course, but later when audiobooks became a commercial product, uh, we have to always have a way to keep our materials um, kind of within our network, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, so at first we started on 33 and a third RPM. Um, eventually that became 8 and a third RPM um, on 10 inch records. Um, with the slower speed, you can get more audio on each record since it's mm -hmm. turning more slowly. The physical grooves can contain more material uh, and play a little bit longer. Mm -hmm. And then it was also a, still a proprietary and protected sort of format that way. Um, that was the dominant format for talking books from the early 30s up until about the mid to late 70s. They began experimenting with cassette, which became the dominant format for many decades after that. Uh, the cassette format they ultimately settled on. Um, it uses a regular um, audio cassette like everyone would have been used to in the 70s, 80s, 90s, mm -hmm. um, except on a typical cassette you have side A and side B um, that are each stereo, so there's a left and right channel. So essentially there's four tracks of audio on each conventional cassette. Um, for our books, since we're doing mono recordings of people reading the books, we use those four tracks independently. So you get four individual tracks on each tape. Uh, the tapes run at half of commercial speed which um, I believe I put the wrong thing on there. Uh, one and seven eighths inch IPS is the, the standard commercial speed. Ours actually run at 15 sixteenths. So I'll have to change that in my slide. <laughs> um, what that turns into, um, if you're using 90 minute tapes and putting about 88 minutes per side, just getting almost six hours per cassette that way. So it was a pretty robust format. Um, they had cassette players that were pretty handy, pretty mechanically sturdy. Um, they lasted, um, gosh, I mean, we did do mechanical repairs to them all the time, but they were pretty robust machines, all things considered. So you need to be like shipping them around. To right. Different people. I mean, I know Absolutely. once you send a, a machine to someone, they pretty much hold on to that and then just mm -hmm. get the cassettes. But still, right. these things are going more through the mail than usually the ones you might have at home. They very much stand so. up to that. Yeah, yeah. They, they do take a bit of a beating over time. <laughs> Um, you know, some of them end up in care facilities and switch between different patrons at oh, different sure. times as people kind of come and go from facilities. So they, they can take some uh, some injuries and of course they're in, they're not being set up like an audiophile stereo set up or something so people, you know, might have their, their coffee sitting next to them and accidentally oh, yeah. spill it, that kind of thing. So they, they the machines do take a beating. That, that still applies to the, the current digital machines too, sure. of course, um, which are also quite robust. Um, so that cassette format, um, it lasted um, from the end of the 70s through the 80s and 90s and the aughts, and in about 2008, we started to transition over to the digital talking book format. Um, this format is predicated on the books being made of a set of audio files and then navigation files that kind of tell the, the system which audio files to play in what sequence, that sort of thing. Um, all those files are encrypted in order to protect copyright. And then the size limitations as a, as a physical medium are basically limited only by the, the storage capacity of the medium that you're using. Uh, the book files tend to be fairly small. The audio is encrypted down to a, what's called a 3GP format. Um, it's basically a cell phone ringtone format. Uh, that makes the, the original audio reduced about, to about a 30th of what the original wave files wow. that were recorded to, to initially create the books. Um, so they tend to be fairly small. Virtually any book ever can be Based onto like a four gigabyte drive. Mm -hmm. um, those, those are just absolutely enormous. In the typical book, you're looking at oh, 150 to 250 megabytes. So they're actually pretty small files yeah. to contain an entire book. It's, it's pretty remarkable. And the technology is getting better and better for storage. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so all of these basically are things that are, are physical formats. Here again is a, a photo of the, the record player that was circulated to patrons. Uh, if someone signed up to use the service, we sent books to them, and then also one of these record players. Um, and then similarly, this is the C1 cassette player that was ubiquitous mm -hmm. for quite a few generations up until, well, I started here in 2005 and we still had tons and tons of them. Yeah, yeah they, <laughs> they were uh, still very much around. We still have, a, there are a few patrons that still like to use them, so we yeah. just keep a tiny handful around. But basically, they're, they've been declared obsolete at this point. So, um, so I wanted to talk about the difference in circulation models that one starts to be able to think about philosophically now that things are, are files rather than necessarily physical formats. Um, so with physical materials, you're looking at, regardless of whether they're analog or digital, they're being stored on physical media, which means that 
for your purposes as a library. They're stored on shelves. Uh, they get circulated to the patrons. However, that happens to, to be whether it's in a public library and someone's pulling materials off the shelves uh, by themselves or whether we're mailing them out to people. Um, we do have some walk-ins here as well that will come in and check stuff out. Um, but either way, when they're finished with materials and they get returned to us, then we have to inspect them, make sure all the, the parts of, of a book are there, and then reshelve all those materials, check them back into our computer system to show that they're available, and then send them out again. With books as digital files, uh, the model becomes potentially more flexible. It depends, I guess, on what, what you can do. So you can consider that books as digital files can be circulated through traditional means in some physical format, but additional methods do become possible. You can respond to evolving technology in terms of changing file formats or uh, changing what types of devices the books are playable on. And then you can start to consider what kinds of distribution approaches you want for the future. So the, the big contrast here, I think, is the, the paradigm of, of physical materials that are stable. Essentially, they're like a, a shelf-stable singular object that's not going to magically transform into some other object versus thinking of books as um, as I'm going to mention here, as a, a distribution approach, um, a flexible, open sort of situation in which the book itself um, can be presented in a variety of different methods. Um, the primary method that we've been using since about 2008 is the digital talking book cartridge. Um, this is a, a specialized shape, uh, basically just a flash memory uh, stick, a thumb drive, like people use, um, placed into a shape that's approximately the size of a cassette. Um, it has an orientation hole on one side to help align it to get into the machine. Um, and then each cartridge under this model was basically designed to be holding one book or magazine, and then it's labeled with large print and braille identifying what that book or magazine is. Um, so essentially this, too, is kind of a shelf-stable product, at least as presented this way. Um, these still had a lot of advantages over the analog materials that we had. Um, they sound better right out of, right out of the box. Uh, there's much better storage capacity. Um, by that, I mean if you had records or tapes of a book, you usually had multiple records or tapes of a book, sometimes massive amounts of multiple <laughs> records and tapes of a book. Um, so keeping track of all that stuff <clears throat> excuse me, and, uh, and playing it in sequence uh, could become kind of a difficulty. Um, so with these, pretty much every book is on one cartridge. You don't have to worry about switching between cartridges to finish the same thing. Um, they also have an, a very much enhanced navigational ease and depth. Um, we can put navigation markers into the files, and so you can switch between chapters, between magazine articles. Um, in more advanced situations, you could switch, um, oh, say, in a, in a cookbook, you could go between the main sections and then drill down to the different recipes in a section and then drill down to the ingredient levels in a section, right. uh, things like that. So they're much easier to use. Um, those things, I think, especially shine in, in nonfiction situations. Um, you can go through and, you know, if you're a student researching, you can really drill down to very specific areas within a, a larger nonfiction text to find what you need. Um, there were two models, or I should say there are two models, and we still very much are using these, uh, two models of the digital talking book player available to patrons, the standard and the advanced. I think I have a photo of them here. Um, they're basically identical other than an extra set of buttons you'll see on the right of your screen. Um, that help you to use some of the more advanced navigational techniques like I was just describing. Um, you can actually get to all of those things on the standard player as well. Um, you just press and hold the fast forward button. Uh, the green button that's kind of just above the, the hole where the, the books go um, is the play and stop button, and then you've got rewind and fast forward on either side of that. Um, those are probably the most important buttons. Then that little yellow set of buttons is for volume up and down. Um, with those, you can pretty much do everything that you need. Um, oh, one interesting thing about these that we discovered between the transition from analog to digital mm -hmm. had to do with um, the fact that you can get an entire book on one cartridge means that if you put a book on and you're a little sleepy, it's like 9 o'clock at night, you usually go to bed at 10, um, the, the tape or the record that you're listening to finished whatever side it was on and stopped. Mm -hmm. The digital book is going to keep on keeping on unless you do something <laughs> about it. Um, so there's a little sleep button, the one that's shaped like a little crescent moon above oh, the play yeah. button. Okay. Um, you can press that to set it to turn itself off so you don't end up like way out of place and not remember uh, where you were in your book. Um, so that can be sort of helpful for that sort of thing, like too. Yeah, that's like on your TV, you have a sleep thing to uh -huh. have yeah. at a certain time. Absolutely, yeah, because yeah, there's no point in just leaving it going. So yeah, <laughs> you can you can kind of make adjustments to those things. So now that we have these multiple distribution approaches, we've just looked at the physical method for distributing the digital talking book files. Um, here's another way. Um, you can use the BARD website. 
Uh, this is a download website that's uh, provided to us by the National Library Service. BARD stands for Braille and Audio Reading Download. Um, through this site, you basically are given a login and a password. Um, a patron can then log in um, on a computer, um, find books that they want, download those books as zip files to their computer, um, unzip the books, and then we can provide you with a blank digital talking book cartridge. They, you, they can be purchased as well online in a few places. Um, and then copy the files over to your cartridge and then play them on, on the player that we provide. Um, there's a bookshelf uh, feature that was added to the software of the machine um, because when people started to use BARD, they were downloading more than one thing at a time, of course, mm -hmm. and it seemed more convenient to put multiple files onto each cartridge rather than just one. Um, because here we don't have that same issue that we have in the library with needing to keep a single book on a single cartridge um, to have on the shelf to be found and, and delivered to someone. Um, since this is sort of a, a user um, triggered event, it makes more sense to let them use the, the media in a different way. So they are able to download and put multiple things on a single cartridge and then use what's called this bookshelf feature. Um, you basically press and hold the play stop button and it takes you to the bookshelf and then you can navigate back and forth with the rewind and fast forward buttons on either side of it um, to find the material that you want to listen to first and then hit the play button and jump to that book. Um, so that was an interesting technology that was added to the player um, on the software side of things after it had already been released because right. it became obvious that it needed to be used. Mm -hmm. So this again is one of those things where you can think about it as um, a way of being able to take these files that comprise the book and then respond to um, user needs as technology continues to evolve and, and find a better, more efficient and, and uh, user-friendly way to deliver those materials. Um, this is kind of what the BARD download website looks like when you first go to it. Um, there's a bunch of search things that you can go into there and uh, find the books that you need and, and download them to eventually put on a cartridge. But another way to do this is to use mobile apps. Um, for the last few years, we've had BARD apps, which basically access that website through apps. Everybody has, everything gets an app. Everything, <laughs> yeah, absolutely, yeah. In this That's case, what people want. That's what they're using. It is. Yeah. It absolutely is. Uh, for talking books, this was kind of a, a big paradigm shift as well because because of the proprietary file format issue that we've always had mm -hmm. um, to protect copyright, this became kind of an interesting situation. Um, by design, all of our materials up to the point of these apps were always designed to only work with playback equipment that we delivered to patrons uh, right. rather than working with commercial devices. So this was kind of an interesting sea change to, to see a, a way of using the talking book collection online um, without having to use a proprietary player of some kind. But again, it's sort of it's responding to the, the way people live their lives, and there's no point in you know carrying around a backpack of proprietary gadgets to access similar yeah. types of things. Um, so the BARD apps were designed for both iOS and Android devices, um, and they can be used in a pretty similar way as the download site with the primary difference being that you can play the materials directly on the, the mobile device itself. Um, whereas with the BARD website, using a laptop or a desktop computer, you still have to put the files onto a cartridge. You can't play them directly on your computer. Um, so that is kind of a, you know, it seems like a small difference, but it's a pretty big difference yeah. if you're a person who's been having to carry a talking book player around as well as your phone for a long time. Um, so as well as people that use, say, like the Kindle Fire or an iPad, mm -hmm. um, if you're using that for all kinds of things and just have it with you everywhere, you can use one of these apps and continue to, to read talking books without having to need a, a secondary device everywhere. Um, really makes it a lot easier for people. Um, unfortunately, we don't have the, the budget or infrastructure to provide those sorts of players to people. So this the is just a, is right. yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a convenience for, for people who already have a device and, and can use it. So um, it's a, an, another option, you could say, and we're still glad to deliver things um, using other methods as well. Um, the mobile app looks pretty similar to the machine. This is just kind of a, a screen cap of um, what the app looks like when you're on the, on the playback screen. Um, the buttons are designed to look very similar. Um, on iOS devices in particular, I think Apple has done a really good job with their voiceover. Um, so you can use the device um, without sight very smoothly and easily and figure out how to get around the screen um, pretty efficiently. It's, it's really roughly about the same level of difficulty to use the BARD mobile app um, sighted or unsighted, I think. It's a, it's a pretty, pretty straightforward app and, and pretty solidly designed. Um, so duplication on demand is most, most of what I want to kind of focus on today, though. So that is kind of our setup of how things are going. Duplication on demand, rather than being um, focused on the patron side of things, kind of starts to analyze how evolving technology affects the back end of things from, mm -hmm. the, from the library side. Um, so ex essentially what's happening here is this is a modified version of making a digital talking book cartridge and distributing them to patrons. 
but it incorporates some of the advantages that we've seen from the downloadable models as well. Um, in this case, cartridges ultimately are still delivered to patrons via the mail. We're, we're duplicating cartridges on a special system, which I'll, I'll show in a minute. Um, people can come in and pick them up if, they, if they're here locally, or we can mail them around the state as we, as we have for many, many decades um, to people all over the state. Um, the cartridges will still play on the machines that we provide, the standard or advanced digital talking book players, um, but the cartridges can have multiple books and magazines on them if people so choose. Um, this, is, again, is totally flexible, so we can make it so that if a person wants to have a bunch of books on a cartridge, we can do that for them. Um, if they prefer just to have one, we can do that for them, or we can even combine those things too. We can make a default setting that they get more than one book on a cartridge, but if they have some particular need that comes up, we can just send them a single book on a cartridge as well. Um, it's, it can really be adjusted as patrons need uh, from that perspective. And then this is integrated with our circulation software, which is called WebReads, and this improves our own ability as well, I think, to select and deliver books, um, which we'll continue to see improvements on as, as time goes on as well. So it kind of starts as a, as a model thinking about things from the library perspective, but I think for patrons who, who don't have, for instance, those mobile devices like I was just talking about um, and only have the player that we provide to them, this will allow them to have some somewhat easier things to deal with um, when a cartridge arrives in the mail, even if they don't have their own devices to, to smooth things out on as well. Um, so this is a, a quick snapshot of what the duplication on demand system looks like. Um, I've got a little video that we'll see in a moment too, um, kind of describing this. On the left is the, the Gutenberg screen. This is um, some Linux software that was developed by NLS um, for this system. Um, the, the little slots on the, on the um, screen app that's open there correlate to the cartridges that are in this giant USB appendage thing over on the right side of the screen. Um, so we can do 20 books at a time. Um, or 20 cartridges at a time, I should say. Even I'm right. still adjusting to the paradigm. Because <laughs> it can be um, more than one. Option. Yeah, each of those yeah. could maybe have 20 or 30 books on them, potentially. Oh, yeah, so how many can they hold? Um, basically, whatever the capacity is. Mm -hmm. um, the system knows the file sizes of each book. Mm -hmm. So if we start to put a whole bunch of stuff on a book and we go over what, it, what the capacity of the cartridge is, it'll give us some warning. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So pretty cool. And then we could split it into two cartridges, or realistically, mm -hmm. by then they have 50 books on the cartridge. Yeah. <laughs> so they're, they're good, and we can probably just wait and send them those later as well. Um, the advantages of this system for patrons, <clears throat> excuse me, I think um, the, the most interesting thing is that if people want, they can get those multiple books on cartridge. Um, their advantage is less fussing with mail delivery and return. If you get a lot of talking books in the mail, um, we have borrowers who read five to ten books a week sometimes. That's a lot um, of mailing back yeah. and forth, yeah. Yeah, your mailbox is constantly full of these giant blue boxes, um, which are smaller than the giant green boxes that cassettes came in, but still they add up, you know, it's a lot of material. Um, also very important to this, I think, there's no waiting for books whose copies are all checked out to other patrons. Um, as any library dealing with physical materials has, has dealt with over time, let's say a, a new bestseller comes out, um, the library was able to acquire 20 copies. The 20 copies are out of all the system libraries almost immediately, and there's a huge waiting list. And you know, it's it's kind of it's frustrating for patrons. It's it's not, you know, sometimes it's unavoidable, but it's it's hard to call that good customer service when you can't provide the book. Mm -hmm. um, in this case, we I mean we've had that same sort of situation. We get um, when we were under the the single book per cartridge paradigm entirely, um, we got depending on our anticipated popularity. For, for a particular book, we typically got between three to nine copies of each book. Um, but if it's really popular, those nine copies can go off the shelf the first day we put it out. Um, this solves that problem. Um, we can duplicate the files as many times as we need. If there, are, if some book club locally decides uh, to switch to a book and we have 20 patrons who are in the book club, all 20 of them are going to get that book the next day if they want it. Mm -hmm. uh, it's absolutely not a problem. Um, so that that alone has just been a huge relief. Like any book anybody wants, the answer is yes. If we if the books available to our system, they can have it right away. Um, similarly, books in series have always been a perpetual problem. Um, that too comes up in public libraries. You know, you might be reading a, a book and book you just finished book three, book four is out. The next one, and you're like, crap, what am I going to do? Not there. Yeah. yeah. So in this case, not only are all the books in the series always available. But typically, unless the series is just astronomically large, I can put the whole series on one cartridge and just send it to you. Like, you want to read the series? Here's the series. Oh, one yeah. You yeah. can have that cartridge. I mean, if you need to hold on to that cartridge for a few months to read the whole series, you, you are certainly welcome to do so. So that's that's a great way to do that. 
Again, fewer cartridges to keep track of around the house, too. Um, again, considering that most of our patrons uh, do have visual impairments, um, sometimes books get lost um, just from simple little things like you're listening to a bunch of books, you happen to set one in a, an unusual place and you don't happen to come across that yeah. place very often. Um, this way, again, it simplifies that sort of thing. You might only have um, two or three cartridges at a time that all have multiple books on them. Kind of easier to keep them near your machine and, and you know, again, streamline housekeeping and that sort of thing. Um, this should, too, help make sure that new books to read are always on hand. Um, we do have some folks who read so many books that when we have new books come out, they read them almost immediately, too, mm -hmm. and sometimes get frustrated because a book will be announced, but the duplicated, the duplicated copies haven't arrived. You haven't gotten them yet. Yeah, oh, yeah. Same thing traditional so, mm -hmm. books, physical books. That's yeah. right. Now if it shows up the on The whole list is huge, and it hasn't even been published yet. That's right. Yeah, <laughs> that, can, that can really be tricky. Um, so that, I think, will help a lot, too. Um, with those like new titles. If NLS puts a new title up on BARD, mm -hmm. I, it's added to my system the same day and I can make copies of it right away. So it, it really makes those things smoother. So uh, this is trying to show um, what it looks like to create a series cartridge. Hopefully that's large enough for folks to see. Um, oh, but you can... Oh, on the wall. oh yeah. perfect. Okay. <laughs> <coughs> Excuse me. A little sip of coffee here. So the series cartridge um, if someone calls into our Reader's Advisors and asks for a particular series, um, they can search by title, author, or subject, but they can also search now by series directly in this duplication on demand paradigm. So here I have my account brought up and someone searching for um, the Harry Potter series. I believe, is that what I put up there? Yeah. And um, you can pull up the whole series, and once you've located it, you can click Add Series to Cartridge rather than just add one book title. Oh, and so put all the whole thing. Yeah. Nice. yeah. And you can even adjust things too. I've, I thought about little, you know, kind of little OCD issues that can come up. Like I remember uh, the, the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe series, the C.S. Lewis mm -hmm. series. There was some controversy as to which is book one and which is book two. If you read them a, in publication right. order or chronological order, mm -hmm. yes, I know I've read right. all of them. Right. Right. Yeah. If someone has a really strong stance about it, um, there are up and down buttons on the screen put, on the right. You can the you order. Can, you can put the series right. in the order that they think it's supposed to be in. Uh, and yeah, mm -hmm. so no arguments with that. It's it's entirely <laughs> flexible. Um, you, you can read a series backwards if you want to, like whatever whatever you want. It's it's entirely flexible, and we can we can set it up for you. Um, the advantages for staff. Um, this is really new territory for us. Again, we started in late October, so we only had a couple months really of, of doing this. Mm -hmm. uh, the transition has gone much much faster than than we expected. Um, Every book is always available for anyone. Um, it, this is kind of, it reminds me of those just-in-time delivery mm -hmm. paradigms that you hear about with internet companies. Um, it's kind of a similar sort of process. Um, obviously, less storage space will be needed for book copies. We have all these copies waiting around for to be borrowed. Um, and it's always more than you need. It, the, this kind of situation is such that it's kind of like if a public library could, you know, just instantly digitally print every book that yeah. somebody needed that day and have, you know, they need room for a couple printers as opposed to all the shelves full of books or something. Um, it's kind of like that. It, it, effectively, it works out that way. Um, this is definitely going to cut down on staff time devoted to circulation activities. Um, right now, with mail cards, the traditional model that we've used, um, first thing in the morning, you print a bunch of mail cards for what's going out that day. Then you pull the books um, for the outgoing mail. Um, then the mail tubs come in and you inspect the books coming back. Um, check the notes in those books, make sure the right books are in those boxes, um, test any cartridges that have notes about some sort of problem, check them all back in, put them back on the shelves to start that whole process again. Um, in this case, um, you, you run a little um, batch to trigger books going out to people, um, scan the cartridges. As you scan the cartridges, it prints their mail card, so you're just standing in one spot, and then you put the mail card in there and toss it in the mail, and you're done. It's, it's kind of a... A, a much more streamlined yeah. process overall. Um, also, we're seeing that our overall mail volume is dropping because of the circumstance of putting multiple books on a single cartridge. Um, I think later in here I've got the exact numbers I pulled for up to the last week anyway for our most current um, statistics showing all of this stuff. Um, so the old model here, the, these are, um, on the left you'll see shelves of digital talking books um, sent to us from NLS and all these blue boxes. Um, our traditional mail card is shown on the right there. And um, basically, the big barcode on there, we scan to identify the patron, and then there's a barcode on the side of the box that we scan to identify the, the item going out. Um, so we'd have to run around with, with um, book trucks, load all these things up, um, and then scan all of them to check them out, and then sort them by zip code order into the mail. Um, and now it's just a much more straightforward process. 
Um, the new books, the, the duplication on demand books are being circulated in kind of a transparent, clear, sort of whitish looking in this photo um, mailing container. So this photo I took about two weeks into the process and already in two weeks our outgoing circulation shows, as you can see here, is almost 50-50 mm -hmm. between the two formats. Yeah. Um, it, it happened very quickly. And so we still have those physical books to zip code because, again, in, in terms of um, distribution approaches to digital talking books, this is still, this whole system is predicated on the physical circulation process, but it just changes the, the nature of what a physical process is in, a, a, I think, a really substantial way. Um, our discoveries so far, yeah, here's my statistics here. So <laughs> we started on October 25th. My gosh, that's been yeah, like exactly two months, yeah. essentially. Um, as of uh, last week, December 19th, we had switched over a little less than half of our patients, 1,658 by my count. Um, in that time, we've sent out 4,624 cartridges in the duplication on demand system. Those cartridges contain 11,681 books, which averages out to just around 2.5 books per cartridge sent. Mm -hmm. um, we can put more on there. Um, we can put less on there. Again, it kind of it depends on what patrons be, request. Yeah, what they want is going to adjust that. Right. Affect that. Yeah. yeah. There are. We do serve a lot of people um, through care facilities. Like we'll send materials. I think the mail card I showed there a moment ago was one of those um, where we'll just send materials to the activities coordinator of a nursing home care facility, that sort of thing, um, and then that person distributes the books to the people within within their facility. Um, in that sort of circumstance, of course, you pretty much do you want to put one book per cartridge because the cartridge is just going to go to people. a whole bunch of different people in the building. Yeah. Yeah. So, so in situations like that, because I think we do serve a lot of people, maybe more than other states. I'm not really sure. I guess I'll have to get some comparable statistics on that. But we do serve an awful lot of people through that that sort of situation, mm -hmm. um, which probably brings our average even down somewhat. Um, it could could even go higher. So, yeah. um, but again, it's if at any way you look at it, that's reducing our mail dramatically. So mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's kind of an interesting um, circumstance. The other thing that surprised me is that our traditional mail card delivery service has already, like last week I think we sent out, I should have the number up here, it was around 50 something books using traditional mail cards the whole week. Um, it's, it's averaging out to about 10 books a day. Um, what's happening is our readers advisors have been switching people over as they contact us. Um, and so, of course, the people that have been contacting us regularly are the busiest patrons that borrow the most. Sure. And so as we've hit that 50% mark, essentially we've already communicated with and switched over the people responsible for about 95% of the actual books we circulate. Um, that did surprise me. We have, a, we have 18 months to complete this transition. Yeah. And effectively, yeah. even though half of the patrons still need to be switched over, like functionally, we already it's, kind of made the transition. It's not, the ones that are left are the ones that only do things like maybe once, once or twice once a, a year. year. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So that, that's been a real surprise. Uh, and patrons have been really excited about the, the change. That's what I was wondering about through all of this that you've been talking mm -hmm. about. And also, you, it's like, how are they taking this, you know? Some people, right. change is scary. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> but Well, you know, it's interesting. Yeah. With, with this particular transition, I know some libraries in the, the initial pilot project that was held last year um, did a lot of communication ahead of time with, with their patrons mm -hmm. saying, hey, this thing is coming. Be um, prepared. Right. Yeah. And I decided not to do that. Mm -hmm. And my reason for that is exactly what you just said, is people get nervous about change. And fundamentally, I think this is number one, a great change, a much more convenient change, and we can switch it back so that things are exactly as they were before if they don't like it. So I'm just kind of doing it first and asking for <laughs> forgiveness later in right. case it's an issue. Mm -hmm. and, and as it turns out, it really hasn't been an issue. Because if you hear about it and you just don't know like physically how it's going to work, right. you're going to build it up in your head, potentially build it right. up in your head as something, oh, this is going to be terrible. It's gonna, I don't know what mm -hmm. is coming. I'm going to be confused. And if you just don't know, right. That you don't have to that dwell. You don't have that print, yeah. you know, dwelling in your mind. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, I was mm -hmm. hearing we made that switch between cassette and digital, and that that seemed to be a, the case for a lot of people. We did you know, yeah. do a lot of like upfront calling. I think we even sent out like a, a postcard mailing telling people, "Hey, this thing is coming." And it just scared. I think we scared people. Yeah, yeah it, was, it wasn't worth it. I mean, yeah. like those books again, like so much easier to use than the cassette mm -hmm. books. It's it's just a, a joy to, to use those machines when you've been using the cassette machine. Yeah. And instead we freak people out, essentially. <laughs> um, so with this, I, again, I think for the most part, it, it, it's the same machine, the same cartridge, same buttons do the same things. Mm -hmm. um, the bookshelf feature has been there forever. Um, a lot of folks may not have used it, but it, you know it's been there. And we've 
trained a zillion people to use it. So our, our way of looking at it this time has just been just to do it and say, oh yeah, this is really easy. This is what you do. Yeah. And we just kind of tell them in a matter of fact, calm sort of way. And they're like, oh, cool. And then they do it and everything's <laughs> great. And so that's what we've discovered so far. That would be Learning my, from history. <laughs> yeah, my, my number one recommendation for any, any talking book libraries that haven't made the transition yet, who might be tuned in, um, that would be, you know, my number one thing is to don't even really talk about it with patrons, just do it. And, yeah. and you know, they'll if they really, really, really don't like having more than one book on a cartridge, um, you can go into your settings and change them back they to getting get one, one, one book per yeah. cartridge at a mm-hmm. time, 10 cartridges just as they were. Yeah. Um, we've been switching people over to things more like um, if, they, if they're happy with it, we'll make sure they can get up to three cartridges at a time. So one's at their house, one's back here, and one's in the mail somewhere in between. So they always have at least one cartridge there. Mm-hmm. Um, and then put as many books as they want on a cartridge, you know, maybe five, maybe ten. Um, so effectively, they could have more books on hand than they've had with physical cartridges if you were sending them, you know, five or ten individual cartridges. Um, they, they might actually have 15 or 20 books now with three books, five books per cartridge, you know. So it's, a, it's an interesting transition. They could actually have more material and way less clutter, you know, to deal with the same amount of material. Um, so again, it's been really positive from that perspective. I think I asked readers advisors last week about this if they had any negative comments, and there really mm-hmm. aren't any other than you know some people being surprised and calling in, and once yeah. they talk them through it, they're completely happy with it, and mm-hmm. it's not freaking them out, it's not overwhelming. But yeah, you build it up ahead of time, and I think it has a, mm-hmm. the potential to become overwhelming, even though yeah. it's much ado about nothing really. Um, so that's been a big takeaway I think for me. Um, the new cartridges look like this. Um, the, the physical cartridges are sort of a peach color. Um, and they all have the same label on them. It just has Nebraska Talking Book Library and our address and audiobooks. It also says that in this, this uh, material has a, a Braille embossing on it as well. Uh, and then the mail cards look a little bit different. Um, because you can put multiple things on a cartridge now, the card that we're delivering um, is a two-piece card. It folds over. So the card that you'll see on your screen on the right um, has what we're calling a manifest at the top, which will list off the books that are on that cartridge. Um, as many as fit, um, you can you can put more than you can yeah. really print. This one has two in the picture. Exactly. Two books. Yeah. Yeah. And then the address that it's being delivered to. Um, once someone's finished with it, they can simply take the mail cart out and recycle it and send the put the cartridge back in the box, send the box back to us. Our return address is already on the box itself. Um, that too is new. Um, the boxes historically, when there was one book per cartridge, had a giant large print book number on the bottom that also had the book number in Braille. Mm-hmm. Um, these, since of course it's different every time, they don't have an individual book label. The, the book label is this, this manifest, but also frankly just pop in the, in the player. Like it'll, as it starts to play, it'll tell you what book it is, you know, easy breezy. So that part's really not, not too complicated. Um, future considerations. Um, right now, magazines are not integrated with the Gutenberg system, so we're just circulating the books this way. Um, magazines come to patrons a few different ways. There's a, a magazine on cartridge program that's run by the National Library Service. Um, those do come multiple magazines on cartridge, but those come to us from contractors. Um, there's a few different contractors around the country that serve different geographic regions. Uh, in the case of Nebraska, it's the um, it's a National Audio Company in Springfield, Missouri serves patrons here. Um, so they'll get multiple magazines on a cartridge, but it won't be the same cartridge as, as we're doing with this, with this uh, system. Um, and the magazines we record here, we're still putting those one magazine per cartridge and sending those out um, as we finish the magazines. Um, eventually, those things will probably be integrated so we can either make a magazine cartridge and a book cartridge or maybe mix and match them, or again, maybe that'll be a patron preference thing. Um, I'm not really sure yet. Um, we're kind of limited by the software design aspect yeah. of this, um, so we'll have to wait and see what happens with that. Um, Braille e-readers are under development by NLS now. Um, the benefit to that will be that these books, again, are all being synchronized. Um, even our system here, um, basically, it has a copy, of, a local copy on it of all the materials that are on that bar download website. Um, there's a lot of Braille on that website, too. And Braille, of course, can't circulate on these cartridges. You need to use, it's a, a web Braille format um, that you need a, a Braille e-reader to use. Um, those things have been cost prohibitive for many, many, many years, but NLS is testing a much more affordable one right now, um, and the hope is a year or two from now we'll be able to have those to, to loan to patrons who, who would like to read web braille using them. Um, so we're looking forward to that. Uh, the Marrakesh Treaty was, was ratified by the United States recently. Um, I'm not exactly sure how that's going to affect us yet, but it will certainly give us more access to foreign and foreign language materials in the coming years. Um, those two, again, hopefully will be somehow integrated in a way that they can be used with this duplication on demand system. 
Um, and then I should mention down the road, what we're probably looking at is this entire duplication on demand system is kind of a, it, it's a, a sub transition, you could say. I think the long term transition that's probably being planned is for a wireless delivery model. Um, we have had a pilot machine here yeah. um, that leveraged wireless delivery using uh, cellular connectivity. Um, with the duplication on demand system, I'm guessing what will happen is the, the newest generation of machines that will come out, which will probably be more than one machine. Um, I know NLS is looking at a few different models for those now um, that all would be similar in having wireless delivery capability. Um, we'll be able to push and pull books wirelessly to those patrons without needing the, the interface of the physical cartridge. Mm -hmm. um, but for people who live in a place, you know, Nebraska is a great example. It's a very rural state. So many places that won't be able to do that. Yeah. yeah. The, these files are, are small by, by flash drive measurements, but by cellular delivery measurements, they're pretty big. Um, so it depends. Um, there, there may be people who live in areas where cellular connectivity or, you know, let's say they don't have a, a Wi-Fi hotspot at home. Um, you know, we have all these rural areas where you can't, I, I say Wi-Fi hotspot like it's just an obvious thing. <laughs> like they're not going to, yeah, there's not a Starbucks option, up the road yeah. from the farms all over Nebraska, you know. And so um, if you've got spotty cell service out there plus no Wi-Fi nearby, um, this duplication on demand model will continue to be used, I think, for an extended period of time, but probably as more of a secondary method. Um, as population demographics go, the majority of our patrons are in the larger towns in Nebraska, Omaha, Lincoln, and the surrounding areas. Um, but there, of course, are people spread out all over the state. So my prediction would be, say, five years from now, it's hard to say when the machines will be developed. Um, we'll have wireless delivery for people in, the, in those larger population areas, and then duplication on demand will continue to provide materials to people who live further out. Um, so that's what I'm guessing we'll see over time. So <coughs> I guess that's the end of my slide. So I will exit this. And um, um, I mean, but you have a question. Oh, yes. Is, um, absolutely. Sue wants to know, at this point, are you still receiving physical copies from NLS? If not, do you, do you plan to do so? That is a good question. Um, at this point, we did, when we started this in October, um, we switched all of our copy allotment quantities down to one copy of each thing, um, thinking again that it was going to be an 18 month transition. Yeah. Um, once we saw, even at the beginning of December, how massively our, our circulation had shifted how already over to this, yeah. um, I did contact NLS and have it killed to zero for each copy. So um, we will still, because those things are on those NLS uh, contracts where the contractors are producing things um, on annual cycles, um, we're told that we'll probably still be getting physical copies of books for about the next six months or so, even up to a year, a few will trickle in, but it'll probably look relatively normal for the next six months. Um, and those books are basically just going to um, pile up until NLS lets me send them back to them for Christmas, I guess, next you year. You were saying before we, mm -hmm. we um, started the show, we were chatting about that there is, there's <coughs> rules about how much you can send back. There's that's right. On yeah, you those, those say, take are, it all and <laughs> yeah, they'll they'll overwhelm yeah. those contractors and they right. they're not happy about that. So, um, so we'll have to see what happens with that. Um, I know that um, the plan right now is that the NLS um, national biennial conference in 2020 is going to be here in Lincoln. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm hoping they let me get rid of them before that, just so they can see like you know what a quote unquote model duplication on demand library look, looks this like. This is what it will look like. Yeah. yeah that yeah. doesn't have shelves full of blue boxes. So we'll see. I, I've never been to a library yet that wasn't. I mean, every time we do conferences and do library tours, um, more or less the the libraries all, regardless of the space that they're in, look kind of similar because they're just yeah. shelves, like massive long shelves full of blue boxes yeah. and green boxes and orange boxes mm -hmm. and, and so forth. Um, this, of course, will change that that whole process to, um, you know, but not even much shelving at all, honestly, because a lot of this, yeah. we're doing a lot of the circulation on turnaround, which means that when someone sends a cartridge back to us, um, we scan that cartridge back in, and about 30 seconds later, it makes a new cartridge for them. We can put it right back in the mail. Yeah. Um, so as far as like needing to have extra extra materials on a shelf, we're talking about maybe just a few book cards for the material. It's it's amazing the the reduction in in stuff. Basically. A big problem then in a in a year or two is going to be what do we do with this extra space we have? Yeah, yeah. That we you know once all these shelves are mm -hmm. empty. Yeah. I'm really glad they didn't carpet around the shelves over there because we're going to pull the shelves out. Yeah. So that's that's going to be. I'm quite relieved that we, <laughs> we, we moved where most of our books are stored um, is a space year. we moved into about four years ago. Yeah. And that would have been really something. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. And she was asking, have many, ha many users had a difficult time using the bookshelf feature? Mm -hmm. um, not really. Um, the, uh, in fact, I brought this up here with me. I'll set this by the mic. 
Um, I made a cartridge that has the announcement at the beginning on here that kind of explains to people how it works. Basically, in order to get to any books, you have to use the bookshelf feature to, to get into any of the materials because of the way the announcement file sits there. So let me turn the machine on. Player on. Press volume up to increase the volume. All right, that should be good. Yeah. So when you first get one of these in the mail, it'll tell you basically how it works. And this, this is the announcement that, that you'll hear. 24 books. Bookshelf instructions. This cartridge contains several books. It was prepared especially for you and contains either the books that you have explicitly requested or books in subject areas in which you have expressed interest. You may select the particular book you wish to read from those available on the player's bookshelf. To enter the bookshelf, press and hold the rectangular play button on the player's front edge for three seconds. When you enter the bookshelf, the player will announce the number of books on the cartridge and the title of the currently selected book. Press the rewind and fast forward buttons on either side of the play button to locate the book you wish to read. When you hear the entire title of the book you wish to read, press the play button and that book will be selected and will start playing. When you are ready to read another book, Return to the bookshelf by pressing and holding the play button for three seconds. Use the rewind or fast forward to find that book and then press the play button to select it. When you wish to return the cartridge to the library, simply return it to the plastic mailing container, remove the address card from the pocket in the container, and place it in the mail. The library's return address is printed on a label affixed to the container to ensure its return. Enjoy your books and remember, to enter the bookshelf to select a book, press and hold the large green play button. So, so at this point, it doesn't start playing a book. Um, you actually have to use the bookshelf feature. So for the, for the few folks who have gotten confused or frustrated and they call in right away, this is the point that they call. And it's, it's actually it's super easy to say, okay, well, press and hold that green play stop button, which I'll do here now. Bookshelf. 24. Books. Book. One. A is for Alibi, a Kinsey Milhone mystery. So I put the whole Seagraph and Alphabet mystery series on here um, <laughs> wow. in, in order. And again, I could nice. change the order on that too <laughs> for some reason I wanted to. But but yeah, once once you've done that, it's really easy just to use those buttons on either side. Two. B is for Burglar. Three. C is for Corpse, That's right. a Kinsey Milhone. So yeah, you can you can move around pretty easily. So yeah, good question. We, we generally speaking haven't had a lot of people who had difficulty with it. But uh, again, if I think we may have had one or two people who were just like, you know, I just don't want to mess with that. And then we can put a back in one book for cartridge, no problem. Yeah. So um, it, it is easy to address if, if someone really is just bothered by that, it. You can always go back. Yeah. The, yeah. But once we but what we've discovered is handling it on the on the back end rather than by warning them about it on the front end is that we can be really casual about it and act like it's no big deal. And then it's not a big deal. And so yeah. that, that I think has been super helpful. Like just, just seeing again how I kept thinking back to the transition to these cartridges from cassettes and how I think we gave people like undue stress about it by talking yeah. about digital, digital, digital all the time. Mm -hmm. Like it was going to be this huge paradigm shift. And it, 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 it is and it isn't. I mean, it's, it's a big paradigm shift, but it's a super easy one that requires less knowledge and skill to use the machine. So that's, that's kind of what I've been thinking at the time. So. Uh, just about the new software. Does the new software that automatically advances the next title on the cartridge work? It does. <laughs> that would be helpful with Siri. Mm -hmm. so it does. There is, so there's automated that yes, it, you don't have we, to get the button. Yeah, there was a firmware update um, for the machine um, that went live. I don't know. If, I think it just went live, or maybe it even hasn't yet, um, for, for libraries that haven't switched to duplication on demand. Um, but for the duplication on demand libraries, we've had it on our system since, since we started in late October. Mm -hmm. um, what that means is that despite what this message says, when it gets to the end of a book, um, it will say, do you want to listen to the next book? Hit play, and you just hit play, and it, takes and it automatically yeah. takes. So yeah, yeah. so yeah. you don't have to go into the bookshelf if you don't want to. Um, we haven't changed that announcement because I think it's easier just to leave that yeah. there so people know the full the full capabilities of it. But the machine will prompt you between books. That's to, nice. It so automatically will say, do you want to keep going? Right. Do you want to go on the next one? Right. Yeah. That again, I think has some functionality similar to the sleep button. Like you don't really want it to just totally go. No. Yeah, you'd want to let say like like, like like it was like. Are you still listening? Right. Are you still uh -huh. listening to people? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> That's exactly right. Yeah. 
yeah. yeah. So it, it definitely helps with that. So I did, if anyone wants to watch, which I guess I'm yeah, in control, I made a little video. Sure. I apologize for the, this, I just made this with my phone last week. So um, because I knew during the presentation we wouldn't really have a way to, to see this system. Um, the talking book libraries have seen demos of these, but for, for anyone else out there, you, you probably won't have. So here's a, a quick video of me just making a cartridge quickly. Um, sorry if it makes you kind of seasick. I tried to hold my phone steady, but this is basically. So this is the book face Friday book we did last. <laughs> how fast this copy is. That's probably good, I guess, for the video. And then I just talked a bunch, but. <laughs> sorry to do this with one hand. Yeah, the rest of it, I yeah. just talk. But yeah, so yeah, sorry if the audio didn't come through. If you blink, you can well. miss it with the duplication there. It's right. so quick. Yeah, 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 it goes really, really quickly. Of course, I just put one book on there, and it was a relatively small book. But yeah, even with larger orders, you know, a few minutes at the most when you're done. Um, and a few minutes gives people, you know, days literally worth of books to read. Yeah. So. And what we'll do is we'll also post this video up with the archives. So oh, if sure. you want to watch it separately and yeah. everything, you can watch the whole thing. And yeah, I don't good. know how the sound was coming through with our recording too here. Right. It might be easier. So we'll also oh, post it on YouTube. That sounds good. Um, yeah. We have a question, which is something I was wondering too, behind we're here. What have been the implications for staff workload? Um, you said it does make you right. know, less staff time to do things. Yeah. But, um, so is there other things that it, yeah, it's come out? up really yeah. quickly, so I'm not fully ready to incorporate what's going on. But long, I, I think what's going to happen um, is circulation staff um, will be able to do. I, it, we're lucky in that our, our main circulation staff person right now is also very talented in other areas, and for example, has a, a massive uh, commercial studio background outside of here. Uh -huh. um, so I think he's definitely going to be able to help out with some studio work, um, maybe with some machines work too. We we haven't even had a a machines um, staff person for over a year now. Um, and it really hasn't been that big of a deal because I've just been keeping up with it bet between uh, myself and our duplication coordinator. Um, we've, we've been taking care of that stuff. Um, so the circulation may be able to help with machines, uh, which again is, I think, workload wise, and it's maybe an hour a day. Um, but fundamentally, I think some more help with, with um, getting the studios moving because we've been shorthanded in our studios for quite some time. 
And I think I'm looking at this as an opportunity to maybe help with that bottleneck somewhat. So that's um, excuse me, that's for when we do local recording right, of them because right. we actually do we don't just get everything from NLS. We right. actually do some of our own mm -hmm. from scratch here right. of Nebraska. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've been we've been keeping up with magazines and their own duplication thing, but we've been getting kind of behind on being able to finish books and get them on the shelf. Um, I think this will help with with that circumstance. Um, we yeah, have what, two, three studios, how many studios? Uh, well, there's two studios and, and a, a couple of editing and post-production rooms. Right, so we have um, people that come in and read right. for us for things that we record mm -hmm. here. Right. <coughs> so that's the thing that needs to be, yeah. Yeah, that, that will help a lot. Yeah, awesome. that's, that's a very good question. So yeah, I'm looking forward to that. I mean, I think that, that will be a really nice opportunity as well um, that will come out of this, you know. So it's kind of win-win. I mean, I, I'm not thinking of this as, I don't think we're going to have um, any problem finding other mm -hmm. stuff for people to do. This will just address like a, a long-term shortage issue. There's been so much work with all. I mean, all the physical things you had to do with trans yeah. uh, with um, all the other the the blue boxes and the green boxes coming mm -hmm. and going and coming and going was right. a lot. I mean, you should the mail coming uh -huh. it just piles and piles. Yep. Of, yeah, those rows, those, that one uh, picture of the shelves. I mean, that's only a couple of shelves uh -huh. here there's, that we have. That is not our whole, entire. Space that's one place that when you're mentioning people coming here to the commission for conferences and things, we take them on tours and right. take them over there and you can see yeah. the, oh, this is this yeah. is huge. There are so many things. Yeah. yeah. Now I don't know what we'll but have now, to tell them. I know. What are we going to show them? It's going to be like, I guess we just show them that computer and be like, it's kind of just magic now. And they, just, they just materialize and we send them out. So, but yeah, there won't be much to look at here. But again, that's good. If you think economically too, of just the, the amount of money that's that's allocated to stuff that just sits on the shelves, and you yeah. have to have it because I mean you are going to send it out, and you, you got to have it. Somebody might want it, yeah. Yeah, so it's one of those tricky things where if there is an alternative way to make it available anytime, any place, in, in mere seconds, it's so much better than having all this money basically sitting around that's that's only rarely used, yeah. you know, per individual copy. Um, so it's it's it really does help to solve that problem. It's been a, a so far again. It's been a, a good process and a very rapid fire change. And again, we were really surprised. I didn't think I'd be talking about the the full implications of what it looked like to be operating under this model for mm -hmm. another six months, probably. And but here we are. I mean, two months in. And, yeah. And when, fundamentally, we made the switch completely. Yeah. When Scott Todd started talking about this is a change coming earlier this fall, I was like, okay, at some point we need to do a show. And he's like, right. well, you're gonna have to wait. I'm like, oh, of course, I know. I'm just right. saying, keep it in your mind that when you have it figured out sometime next year, right. or whenever this is all excuse <clears throat> me, boiled down to what it is, and then he said, you know, uh, that, we're good now. <laughs> that, that happened. <laughs> it is half, yeah. halfway done. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, it was remarkable. So, yeah, the other folks left, I don't, I don't think will be um, too difficult. Yeah. So, um, another um, question. So, oh, she's asking about the show. Yeah, oh. thank you. Very informative. Yes. Um, yeah, I should say it's a little after 11 o'clock, so we probably will be wrapping up soon. Um, how long does it take to make the archive available? Archive of this show, um, we should have it done before the end of the day today. Right. Um, it processes this process pretty pretty quick from our GoToWebinar system, and then it's just I got to upload it to YouTube, so I'm at the mercy of of them. Yep. <laughs> um, usually it's done by the end of the same day. Um, everyone who attended today and everyone who registered will get an email directly from me letting you know when it is available. And we'll have the archive of the show, uh, Scott slides, and as I said, we'll also upload that video okay. so you can watch that whole thing as well um, and see everything that was done. Uh, and you'll know, go over, you know, pause on the screens and see what it looks like if yeah. you want to see, you know, that how it's going to be for you guys using it in your own um, uh, state libraries right. if, you're, if you're doing this. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, so it should be by the end of the day today, as long as everything cooperates. <laughs> <laughs> it usually does. All right. Um, any other questions? Go ahead and type in. Um, we can take any questions you still have. Uh, we do not have to cut off here right at 11. What I will do, though, I'm going to um, bring up. Um, oh, that's the video. Oh, the yeah, upcoming. Get, yeah, get my. There we go. Um, I'll show you first here, too. Um, the, our talk about the Braille service. This is the Library Commission, the Nebraska Library Commission's website, nlc.nebraska.gov. And um, off here in our flyout menu is where we have the talking about the Braille service thing. So I don't know if you want to show specifically some parts there where people go to find more. Or yeah, or um, if they if they the come to the thing. yeah the main the main page is just yeah Nebraska NLC Nebraska gov slash TVBS will take you to the main page as well. Yeah. And um, with the flyout windows, um, the about section has I think the the most critical stuff. Mm -hmm. um, 
the application, well, actually, the application process is more critical there, that second section. Yeah. That's where you get applications and sign up. Um, you can also contact us by email through the information there. Um, and our readers' advisors are always available to uh, help answer mm -hmm. questions for people who are new to the service and kind of make all that stuff kind of straightforward, too. So, yeah, I really like this just slash UBS page because yeah. it kind of just gives you the whole setup. The, the About Us here lays out what we do and, and has hyperlinks to the other sections as needed. Mm -hmm. um, so you can kind of just figure out what's happening pretty pretty quickly there. Um, yeah, so if yeah. you want to know what's mm -hmm. going on and what we're doing here, right. this is where to go for mm -hmm. that. Absolutely. Yeah. So, And you can always call us, too. Our, our 800 number is 800-742-7691, and that will get you in touch with one of our Three Rivers advisors who uh, work with people all day long on um, finding books that they like, uh, making sure everything's working correctly for them, mm -hmm. uh, and talking to new and potential patrons as well. That's a specific 800 number that we have, which is nice to, for um, right. CBBS. Mm -hmm. um, we have a separate 800 number for, for everything else at the yep. commission. So that's right. That's right. Um, and I think we have that info everywhere at the, on our website. Mm -hmm. too. Yeah. All right. So um, that will call that wrap it up for today's show. Looks like nobody typed in any desperate questions just the last few minutes as we've been chatting. So mm -hmm. um, that's good. If you, so I'm going to go now to our uh, library. Or, Encompass Live website. We do have that off of our main page. Back to here, under education, we have a link for Encompass Live, um, Encompass Live webcast. But you can also use your search engine of choice or our library question search, whichever. So far in the world, in the internet world, Encompass Live. We are the only thing called this. So you won't find anything else if you just Google our name. <laughs> um, it'll bring you right to our. Uh, um, nlc.nebraska.gov slash Encompass Live. And uh, the archives will be here. This is our upcoming shows, but our archives are right here underneath our upcoming ones. And they're just um, in reverse um, date order. So the most recent ones at the top of the list. And this is the, most re the one we did last week about textbook programs. And this is where to the today's show will be. There'll be a link to the recording, a link to the presentation. And this one, ours will have a third link. So it'll be to that extra video right. that uh, Scott did as well. Um, and while I'm here, I will show you, this is our archives that actually goes back to, this is actually, uh, this is our last show of the year oh, of yeah. 2018. And 2018 is, because we're still in the year, the 10th year of Encompass Life. Wow. Yeah, it's kind of crazy. Wow. Uh, we've gone this long. So this is actually our archives going back to the very beginning. If I strolled all the way through this, you'd see, here we got 2016. It goes all the way back to the first show, which was January 2009. Wow. So, um, we are librarians, though. We archive things. It's what we do. That's we right. historically keep stuff, so we will keep these. Are always going to be up here, but do keep in mind that there may be some old information, some um, expired information, right. some things that aren't um, links might not work anymore, or uh, some services might not exist. But for historical purposes, we have all of our archives here. But everything does have a date, so you'll know exactly when it was originally broadcast. So you can always say, oh, well, that happened. That was in 2016, and now it's like mm -hmm. two, three years later, or whatever. I should maybe double check and make sure that's still a thing. <laughs> I think we introduced the digital talking book format back in around, around that time. Too, we did at some point, and we do have on here now because it got so huge. Oh, uh, yeah. We have a search feature right. where you can search our entire history or just most recent 12 months. Nice. So I wonder if I can. Um, but yeah, I think there was. I seem to remember. If I do that, will it? Here we go. So, uh, yeah, actually, well, we started off the, our, right. our show with Meet the Commission just a couple of, uh, so mm -hmm. that back in January 2009. But, yeah, here's um, just typing in TBBS, all the things we've done over the years. So you can see um, when we moved to the new mm -hmm. location that you were talking yeah. about, downloads and apps. Uh, yeah. So. Awesome. And we just did a session recently yeah. too about um, desktop, non-visual desktop access, a new thing that's going yeah. coming. Yeah, Amanda so, has a great. Yeah, yeah our really technology innovation librarian Amanda Sweet did a session. So, yeah. um, if you're interested in anything TVBS, the history of what we've done, you can see all that. Awesome. Yeah. All right. So that's our uh, archives, and I hope you join us next week when our talk, um, our, our topic of our first show of 2019 is Best New Teen Books of 2018, Popular Teen Novels, New Books They Need to Read. Um, Sally Snyder, who is our coordinator of Children's and Young Adult Library Services here, will be on, on here. And joining her will be Jill Annis, who's from our Elkhorn Granting Middle School here in Lincoln. And then we can show yeah. I think so. Yeah. yeah. Um, and this is a session um, for anyone who is noticing. This was originally, this is um, rescheduled from, it was supposed to be December 
5th, the first uh, Wednesday of this month. But uh, we were closed that day. It was the um, it, um, all, all federal offices, and as a result, our state offices here were closed for the um, President Bush's oh, funeral. Yes, that's that was right. a state holiday, a federal holiday. Right. So this one got rescheduled to January 2nd. So if you're looking for this one, that's when it is. Um, this is uh, Sally actually does a regular Best New Teen books of a previous year and Best New Children's books. The children's one's been done in our archives, and the teen one will be next week. She'll be our first show of 2019, so do show up for sign up for that one, and any of the other shows we have listed here, we're always scheduling more, so as I'm working with people, more dates will be filled in here. Uh, we're also on Facebook. If you're a big Facebook user, give us a like over there. There it goes. You'll get notifications about, there's the one for logging in for today's show, when recordings are available, we post on here. No, I don't want to log in now. So um, when last week's recording was available, there it is. So if you do like to use Facebook, we do post there a couple of times a week and you can keep up with things that way. Other than that, that wraps it up for today's show. Thank you so much for walking across the hall to Absolutely. join us here Thanks. today. Thanks for having me. And uh, thank you everyone for attending. We'll see you next year <laughs> on Bye-bye. <laughs> <Okay. laughs>